Welcome to a video tutorial of Auction RPM. My name is Dan Zumwalt and I'll be your guide through this discussion of the Inventory Master Screen. The Inventory Master Screen is a screen that is used for entering in information about inventory that you may not know exactly which auction that inventory is sold in. The typical scenario is where the auctioneer has a warehouse the warehouse has a loading door in the back where people will drop off their inventory that will be auctioned off. That inventory is then stored in a warehouse and then at some point in the near or possibly distant future that inventory is then included in an auction that the auctioneer has decided to schedule. When the inventory is included in an auction that inventory is assigned a lot number and thus is now part of the actual auction itself. The place where inventory is entered in to auction RPM is in the inventory master in this scenario. Then later when the inventory is entered or assigned to an auction that is done in the add edit lot screen. Now this arrangement is one way of many that you can manage inventory in auction RPM. If, when you're entering an inventory into Auction RPM, you do know what auction it's going to be in, and in fact what lot number that item is going to be, then you could circumvent the usage of the Inventory Master screen altogether and go straight to the Add Edit Lots screen. We're going to be talking about that in a little while, too. But to begin with, in order to lay some groundwork for this discussion, which will center on the Inventory Master, Let's first go to Auctions and then Preparation, and then let's go to the Schedule and Auction screen. The Schedule and Auction screen, as was already discussed in a previous video, contains the Details tab, and on the Details tab there are four tax code fields here. These tax code fields define what taxes are going to be charged at this particular auction. Now typically, you're only going to be setting up one tax, the sales tax for whatever location the auction is going to be held at. If there are going to be cases of where you're going to be charging more than one tax, or maybe you might have an auction where some of the items are subject to a farm tax, whereas other items are subject to a sales tax, well, you can identify multiple taxes in this area in the schedule and auction screen. Now, Let's put that little morsel of information on the shelf for a moment. We're going to refer back to that in just a minute. Let's exit out of the Schedule and Auction screen, and we're now going to go straight into Inventory Master, also found under the Preparation tab under Auctions. When I click on the Inventory Master, that'll take me to the Inventory Master screen, and that will present to us uh, several pieces of information that we're going to center in on right now. To begin with, at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice the familiar listing of records, and as was discussed in a previous video, whenever you select a record in this list at the bottom, whatever record is selected, then the detail for that record is, is going to be shown in the detail area on the top of the screen. In this case, the list down below has a record called Railroad Spikes, and so as a result you can see that up here in short description it says Railroad Spikes. Now not all the information in the record is shown in the list down below. You of course could scroll to the right and you can see some of the other pieces of information, key pieces of information about this inventory record. But really the detail area up on top is where you really want to be. You'll also notice that just above the list at the bottom, over here on the right hand side, you'll find a listing indicating how many records there are in that inventory record list. Now this list right now that we're looking at at this moment it only has one record listed but that's not all the records that are in this table at this moment. How do we know that? Well to begin with you'll notice that the display options right here is set to show unassigned inventory only. That means that this list down here at the bottom is only going to show unassigned inventory. Let's change this, perhaps, to show all inventory. And when I do, you're now going to see a lot of information. You Actually, in this case, eight records. But you're going to see other records that were not previously shown. I'm going to highlight one of them, this genuine imitation pearl necklace. And you'll notice if I click on the history 
for this genuine imitation pearl necklace, you'll see here is the history. It, the inventory item record was created. Then it was assigned to lot number two for auction number one, the sample auction, Leakless Waterworks. And then on February 7th, 2005, it was sold to bidder number 21 at auction number one for 250. Well, in this case, yes, it was sold, meaning that a bid was entered in to this, uh, uh, to the lot number that contained this inventory record. But you'll notice that there's no entry here for uh, an indication that it was invoiced. And so as a result, this record is not regarded as a record that had been invoiced and completely sold. And so as a result, it did not show up when we said that we wanted um, uh, unassigned inventory only. What I'm going to do now, let's go over to General. And we can see railroad spikes here. That's the that's the one item that is here. I'm going to edit this record that's here already, so we can look at a little more detail about these items. First of all, you'll notice that the quantity field indicates that there's only one railroad spike. Now, this quantity field is later fed into the bid entry screen, and it acts as a multiplier for the bid. If, for instance, there were 10 railroad spikes and we're intending on selling these spikes individually, or we're potentially going to do what, I, what is commonly referred to as a times the money auction, then you would go ahead and put a 10 in the quantity field, and then that 10 would show up in the bid entry screen. Now, that quantity can be overridden by the bid entry clerk at that point, but it, at any rate, you can uh, identify a quantity here. The short description here is a field that uh, allows a maximum of 80 characters. The long description here is an unlimited size field. You could write war and peace in that field if you wanted to. Now this one field shares two uh, field headers. Right now we're looking at the long description, but I could just as easily click on condition report, and now I could enter in a condition report into this field here. If I click back on long description, I can go back to seeing what the long description is. Now this field is an unlimited size field, but in reality the amount of available real estate on this screen is very little for the long description. If I want more, then I can just click on more, and that's what I'm going to do here. And so now you can see that I have plenty of room to stretch out my arms and I can enter in uh, lots of information about this railroad spike in this long description. I'll go ahead and hit cancel here. The next field down is category code. Category code is an identifier indicating how this item can be categorized. Right now you can see that this railroad spike is categorized simply as general merchandise. But I could easily click on this auto locator button which would pop up the auto locator field and I could turn around and identify exactly what kind or category of inventory this railroad spike is. Let's say, for instance, that uh, this, the railroad spike qualifies as a vehicle or something like that. I would choose vehicle. If the category that I needed wasn't here, then just like every other auto locator in Auction RPM, I always have the opportunity of adding a new inventory category in this case. What I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to go ahead and choose Antiques, indicating that this is an antique railroad spike. The next field down is Consigner Code. This is an indicator as to who owns this railroad spike. Right now, this railroad spike is marked as being owned by Billum and Lovett attorneys. You'll also notice that aside from the demarcation that Billum and Lovett attorneys owns this railroad spike, you'll also notice down here that we are indicating that when the railroad spike sells, we want to charge 35%. This is a consignment fee code, code number one, that was created in the master data screen. We can also see the listing of different consignment fee codes that are on file by clicking on this consignment fee code button here. That will give us another auto locator, this one right here. However, this one is oriented towards the consignment fee codes master table. In this case, there is only one consignment fee defined here, and so this is the only one that I can select if I wanted to. 
Now let's suppose that for this case, maybe most of the material that Bell and Lovett attorneys brings in, we charge 25%. But let's suppose that this is a very rare railroad spike. Maybe it's the golden spike that was uh, sent into the uh, ground at Promontory Point connecting East and West Railroads. Well, if that's the case, then we probably are going to be getting quite a bit of money for it. And also, as a result, we are pro probably not going to be able to charge or not going to be allowed to charge 35% or a consigner. A consigner probably wouldn't stand for that. So let's suppose that we did a real special negotiation and we told the consigner, okay, we'll sell this railroad spike for you, but be in consideration of the fact that this is a high dollar item, a high interest item, maybe we'll just charge 5% on the consignment feed for just this one item. Well, what we would do here is I would hit Add New. I would indicate a human readable description for this new consignment fee code called 5%. Then under rates and prices, I would say that where the sale price is between 0 and 9999999, that the percent that I want to charge is 5%. Keep in mind that this column of percent, this is a percent field. That means 5% is read as 5.00. 10% would be 10.00. 10% would not be Point one. Keep that in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save here and now we have a new consignment fee code. It's code number two now that it was just created and this consignment fee code has been assigned to this railroad spike that we have right here. Now that doesn't mean that from now on all of the rest of the material that Bill and Lovett Attorneys brings in will be at 5%. The consignment the consigner record for Bill and Lovett attorneys has marked as 35% as their default consignment fee code. So all of the rest of the inventory that Bill and Lovett attorneys brings in will actually receive 35%. We've just simply marked this one item as uh, being an item that we're going to charge 5%. Consignment fees, as you can probably discern now, are calculated on an item by item basis. And so here, this railroad spike, we're just going to be charging 5%. The source code field is typically a field that's used if, in fact, you purchase inventory for sale at your auction facility. It can allow you to identify where you purchase that inventory, and then later, it you can pull a report that will compare the cost field, which is right here, to the amount that you actually were able to sell the item for, and you can actually see a profit and loss report on all of the inventory that you purchased and then sold. Now remember how earlier we were talking about the four different kinds of taxes that were scheduled for the auction? Well here is where you can identify whether or not this item, this railroad spike, is subject to tax one or subject to tax two. Again, if you were doing an auction where some items were subject to sales tax, whereas other items were subject to farm tax, you can manage the applicability of the different tax rates by managing these check marks that are here. These fields are your estimates. Your low estimate is here. Your high estimate is here. You also have cost, insured value, appraised value. These are informational fields for you. The cost field, by the way, is also tallied up and reported and reflected in the auction analysis and summary which is report number 81. That report has a line in there that gives you the total cost of goods sold. So again it uh, you would want to make sure that if you do purchase inventory for sale at your auctions you would want to maintain this cost field and maintain the information in there so that when you do pull that auction analysis and summary which does give you a bottom line net profit for the auction, you can factor in the amount that you paid for the items that were sold at this auction. You'll also notice that there is a reserve price here, and next to it, a reserve type. Now, reserve price is self-explanatory, but reserve type bears a little explanation. Reserve type has a few different settings in here, none, 
STC or subject to confirmation, NR, no reserve, standard reserve, and then you have net. Now net is a special reserve type. If you have a reserve in this inventory record, and if you set the reserve type to net, then what's going to happen is, let's suppose, let's explain it this way. If you have a reserve of, let's say, $100, and let's suppose that the, re the consignment fee code here is 35%. Well, in this scenario, if there was no reserve and it sold for $100, then the amount that the auctioneer keeps would be $35. And the consigner would then take home $65. But let's suppose that there was a reserve here of, well, let's say the reserve was $90. And let's suppose that it was a net reserve. Well, the consignment fee code might indicate that the fee is 35%, but if this item sold for $100 and the reserve was $90 and it was a net reserve, that means that auction RPM would make sure that the bidder, or excuse me, that the consigner would receive $90, even though the remainder, the $10, falls well below what the consignment fee code defines here. That's because that reserve is a net reserve. It was a guarantee by the auctioneer. Let's also suppose that the reserve is uh, $100, and it's a net reserve. And let's say that the consignment fee code says 35%. If the auctioneer sells the item for $100, then how much is the auctioneer going to take from this? Absolutely nothing. They're going to take zero. Because, again, that reserve was a, a guaranteed reserve. Let's suppose that the reserve was $100, the reserve type was net, and the winning bid was $80. How much would the auctioneer take, or what would happen in that case? Well, in that case, the auctioneer would actually end up paying $20 to the consigner in order to meet the $100 guaranteed reserve. Obviously, the auctioneer would only do that if it made business sense, if there was a bunch of other inventory that was being sold at the same time, and by selling this item below reserve, it made it possible for the auctioneer to make other uh, bids come in at a much higher than reserve. So obviously, that's something that is a uh, decision point for the auctioneer. I'm going to branch over here to imaging here, and this is where we can identify uh, images that uh, we want to record in auction RPM of this railroad spike. To record an image here can be done a few different ways. You can do drag and drop, which means you would open up another window that shows the photos, and then you would just drag a photo from that window and then drop it into this area right here. Or you can click on capture image here and then open up your uh, hard drive, scan down to where maybe you have some uh, pictures that are that are uh, uh, stored on your computer and then once you have those pictures uh, picture um, listed in here I'll go ahead and select some pictures in here I'll, I'll click on one of them you can see a preview of the picture you can even hold down shift and, and highlight multiple pictures all simultaneously and then hit capture image and it'll bring those pictures back that picture or those pictures back once you have brought the pictures back here you can slide this slider bar and take a look at all of the pictures that have been brought back. You can also use these up and down arrow keys in order to change the order. This right now is showing the primary image. This is the primary image that I've brought in. And the primary images are the first image or the main image that are shown if you happen, if you happen to be using such services as Proxybit, Live Auctioneers, NAA Live, or the like. But let's suppose that instead of this image, I want to make, let's say, this image, the primary image. Well, all I have to do is, with this image showing, I'm going to hit the up arrow and watch what happens to that scroll bar below the picture. I'm going to click it now, and now you can see that this image has moved up in order. I'll click it again, 
and now this image is the primary image. So you can use these up and down arrows in order to change the sh and shuffle around the order that the photos appear. Finally, I'm going to click on Vehicle Information, the Vehicle Info tab, and here is where you can record a lot of vehicle information for this inventory record if you are selling a vehicle. You have the type, the make, the model, the year, the cylinders, engine, transmission, color. All of these, or most of these fields, are auto-locator fields, as you can see by the existence of these buttons next to the field. So if you are selling a vehicle, and if you wish to keep detailed information in this manner about the vehicle, then please be my guest and do so. Finally, you also have the History tab, as you saw earlier, and this will give you the history for whatever inventory record you're working on. Obviously, if you're entering in a brand new record, then uh, there would be no history, but the history would then be compiled here and can be consulted later if you needed to see what happened to a particular item. I'm going to, hit, going to go ahead and hit the Done button here and answer Yes to Save Changes, and that'll return us back to a preview mode where then perhaps I can click on some other inventory records that might be listed here, or I could exit out of this screen. Now we haven't touched on all of the particular features of this screen. Uh, there are things such as custom field data, expenses, defects, and some of the buttons that are down here that are all part of a more advanced lesson in the usage of the Inventory Master. And perhaps we'll go ahead and touch on that in a later video. Suffice to say though that the usage of the Inventory Master is where you would enter in inventory into Auction RPM inventory that you may not know what auction and what lot number it would be in that auction. Then later, when you're ready to pre-lot the auction, you can take inventory that is regarded as general inventory, which is unassigned inventory, and you can then assign that general inventory to a new auction that you have scheduled. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit exit here. I'll return back to the main menu and that will conclude our discussion of the Inventory Master. If you have any questions or comments about this video or any of the other videos in this instructional video series, please feel free to give us a call at our offices. The phone number we can be reached at is 209-588-1232. Thank you for listening, and I hope to hear from you soon.